In this video, we're going to cover the regulation of the cell cycle, looking at what initiates the cycle and what stops it from continuing. Now, if you haven't seen the previous lecture on the cell cycle, I highly suggest watching that first because it connects with this one. If you have seen it, let's do a quick recap anyway, because it will be a nice refresher for you. As we covered in the previous lecture, the cell cycle is an ordered sequence of events or a cycle of duplication and division that occurs in a cell. The stages of the cell cycle are divided into two major phases, interphase and the M phase. During interphase, the cell grows and makes a copy of its DNA. We can divide interphase into three stages. In the G1 phase, the cell grows and becomes larger. Cells in the G1 can also exit the cell cycle and enter the G0 phase, a state of quiescence. So cells can enter G1 either from the preceding M phase or from the G0 phase. The cell then enters the S phase, where DNA synthesis occurs. The cell duplicates its DNA, and then the cell prepares for mitosis through the G2 phase. Moving on to the M phase, this is where the cell distributes the two copies to opposite ends and divides its cytoplasm, forming two new cells. It's comprised of mitosis, in which the cell's nucleus divides, and cytokinesis, in which the cell cytoplasm divides to form two daughter cells. And mitosis is further divided into prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, PMAT. There's an overlap between the end of mitosis and cytokinesis. So cytokinesis completes the mitotic phase, and we have two new cells, each with a completely identical set of chromosomes. What a beautiful, gorgeous process. Now, to make sure eukaryotic cells replicate all their DNA and organelles and divide properly, eukaryotic cells have regulatory proteins known as the cell cycle control system. Cells move through the cell cycle in a regulated way to ensure that the cell cycle's events, DNA replication, mitosis, and other processes occur in a predetermined order, and that each activity is finished before the next one starts. The cell cycle control system directs the steps of the cycle and prevents cells from dividing in unfavorable circumstances. And the control system is regulated at certain points of the cycle by feedback from the activity that is being carried out. So information about their own internal state and signals from the environment to decide whether to proceed with cell division. Without this feedback, a delay in any of the steps could be, it could be detrimental and we don't want that. And this is where checkpoints come in. In the eukaryotic cell cycle, a checkpoint is... Think of it as a time where the cell examines both internal and external signals and decides whether or not to continue with division. Think of checkpoints as traffic lights. The cell will come to a halt at these checkpoints, inspect the situation, and then give the green light if everything is in order, if everything is all good. There are three important ones we're going to look at. The G1 checkpoint is at the G1 slash S transition. The G2 checkpoint is at the G2M transition, and there's one at the M phase. This is a spindle checkout at the transition from metaphase to anaphase. Let's briefly go through these checkpoints. At G1, if a cell does not receive a go-ahead signal, it may exit the cycle and enter the G0 phase, a non-proliferative state. When extracellular conditions are undesirable, cells can postpone progress through G1 and even enter G0. Cell growth in animals depends on certain signal molecules in the external environment. Before we can proceed to the S phase, the control system confirms that everything is favorable for proliferation before continuing to DNA replication. So some factors a cell checks is the size, because we need to make sure the cell is large enough to divide the nutrients. It needs to make sure there's enough energy to divide and whether or not the DNA is intact. But essentially, if a cell doesn't get the green light signal it needs at the G1 checkpoint, it may leave the cell 
the cell cycle and enter the G0 phase. Moving on to the G2 checkpoint, the cell will check for any DNA damage and if the DNA has been successfully replicated. So the cell will stop at the G2 checkpoint to allow for repairs if errors or damage are found. If there are any issues, the cell will try to repair the damage or fix any errors. What a legend. However, if the damage is irreparable, the cell may go through apoptosis or programmed cell death because the cell doesn't want to pass damaged DNA onto daughter cells. Now, moving on to the next checkpoint, it's in the M phase. So there's also a checkpoint in the M phase. A cell in mitosis receives a stop signal when any of its chromosomes are not properly attached to the mitotic spindle, which is a component that separates the chromosomes during mitosis. When all the chromosomes are attached, a cell will give a go-ahead signal, allowing the cell to continue into anaphase. The cell will pause mitosis until all the chromosomes are captured by the spindle. That's the M phase checkpoint. Basically, in the event of unfavorable extracellular or intracellular conditions, the control system has the ability to momentarily stop the cycle at specified transition points in the G1, G2, and M phases. All right. That's an overview of the checkpoints and the factors that determine whether or not the cell will pause or progress at each checkpoint. But now we need to go through how these checkpoints actually work and how the regulatory proteins that move the cell cycle forward are activated or inactivated by internal and external signals via signaling pathways within the cell. So now let's subtract complexity and break down the components and molecules that make up the regulatory system. The main proteins and protein complexes that start or control DNA replication and mitosis are periodically activated and then inactivated by the regulatory system. We're going to look at a few important regulators. The two main types are the proteins called cyclins, enzymes called CDKs, which are protein kinases, and an enzyme complex called the anaphase promoting complex. We'll take a look at cyclins and CDKs first. All right. Generally, regulation of the cell cycle is through the phosphorylation and dephosphorylation of proteins. An important thing to know is that one of the most common ways for cells to switch the activity of a protein on and off is through phosphorylation followed by dephosphorylation. And the cell cycle control system uses this process. So starting with cyclins, this group of proteins are called cyclins because of their cyclically fluctuating concentration in the cell. There are four types found in most eukaryotes. We have G1 cyclins, G1S cyclins, S cyclins, and M cyclins. Each cyclin is linked to a certain phase or transition in the cell cycle and influences the activities that take place during that phase. For example, M cyclin encourages M phase activities, including the breakdown of the nuclear envelope. As you can see here, the levels of the various cyclins change significantly throughout the cell cycle. The cyclin associated with each phase increases significantly at the period where it's required. Now, here's the thing. A cyclin must activate or inactivate several target proteins inside the cell in order to move the cell cycle forward. And this is where the second group of proteins come in, protein kinases. Protein kinases are enzymes that activate or inactivate other proteins by phosphorylating them. They attach phosphate groups to specific target proteins. Similar to the cyclins, kinases are activated at appropriate times in the cycle. As a result, each of these kinases experience periodic rises and falls in activity. However, to activate these kinases at appropriate times, they must be attached to cyclins. Cyclins have no enzymatic activity themselves, and the kinases must attach to cyclins in order for them to become enzymatically active. All right? So these kinases are called cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs. They depend on cyclin to become enzymatically active. CDK by itself is inactive, so it can't act on target proteins, but the binding of a cyclin activates it and it becomes a functional enzyme that can now act on target proteins. Let's go through this again. When a cyclin attaches to a CDK, it activates the CDKs and directs the CDK to a specific set of target proteins because cyclins have no enzymatic 
activity themselves. And together, we have a cyclone CDK complex. All right, so in simple terms, what do these cyclone CDK complexes do? These complexes, cyclone CDK complexes, if activated, aid in triggering a variety of cell cycle events, such as entry into S phase or M phase. Now, in most eukaryotes, there are many types of CDKs and cyclones that are involved in controlling the cell cycle. Throughout the cell cycle, CDK levels stay it stays generally constant, but as the concentrations of different cyclones fluctuate, so do CDK activity and target proteins. And different cyclone CDK complexes activate various cell stages. For example, cyclones known as G1 cyclones function earlier in the G1 phase, and they bind to other CDK proteins to produce G1 CDKs, which help the cell move through the G1 phase and into the S phase. And then late in G1, there are different CDK proteins that bind to additional cyclones, known as S cyclones and G1S cyclones, to create SCDK and G1S CDK complexes. And these complexes help in the initiation of the S phase. The G1S CDKs phosphorylates regulatory proteins that activate transcription, the transcription of genes required for DNA replication. G1S cyclones would direct CDKs to S phase targets to trigger DNA replication. So the enzymes involved in DNA replication are activated. All right, that's just beautiful. Honestly, you know what they say, we're all in this together. Teamwork, my man. Now, each kind of complex initiates a distinct cell cycle transition step by triggering a variety of target proteins. Let's go through another example. The M cyclones would direct CDKs to M phase, so for example, to break down the nuclear membrane. This complex would phosphorylate, it would add phosphate groups to their targets. Okay, that's how the cyclone CDK complexes work. Before we move on to breaking down how cyclone CDK complexes are regulated, let's go through the names of the main cyclones and their gorgeous CDKs. Starting with the G1 CDK complex, it's cyclone D. In mammals, there are different forms of cyclone. There's D1, D2, and D3. And the CDK partner is CDK4 and 6. The G1 as CDK, the cyclone is E and CDK2. And then for the SCDK complex, we have cyclone A and CDK2. And then the MCDK complex, which is cyclone B and CDK1. It spells out D. Okay. Now, how is the activity of these complexes, cyclone CDK complexes, regulated? It also depends on phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, and that's how it's switched on and off. So think of it as an on and off switch. Remember that this is one of the most common mechanisms by which cells switch the activity of a protein on and off by phosphorylating and then dephosphorylating them. Let's go through this. There are inhibitory phosphate that are present in the cyclone CDK complex. And in order for the CDK to become active, a certain protein phosphatase must dephosphorylate it. Here we have the M cyclone CDK complex. And when this complex is formed, it's going to be phosphorylated at two adjacent sites by an inhibitory kinase called V1. This keeps MCDK in an inactive state until these phosphatases are removed by an activating phosphatase called CDC25. And once we've removed the inhibitory phosphate, we can now have we now have an active MCDK complex. So the activities of cyclone CDK complexes are regulated by protein kinases that phosphorylate and phosphatases that removes phosphates, which also aid in controlling the cell cycle's progress. That's one way to regulate these complexes. Another way is we can also block CDK activity by the binding of CDK inhibitor proteins. These inhibitor proteins can block the formation or activity of certain cyclone CDK complexes. For instance, some CDK inhibitor proteins assist in keeping CDKs inactive throughout the G1 phase of the cycle, delaying entry into the S phase. And you're probably thinking, why would the cell delay entry into the S phase? Well, remember what we said earlier. The cell doesn't want to rush the process. It needs to make sure that everything is all good. So this is 
one of the reasons as to why we'd want to block the activity of certain cyclone CDK complexes so that the cell can continue to develop or it can wait until extracellular conditions are appropriate for division. With that said, the cell cycle control system has the ability to temporarily suspend the cycle's progression at various transition points, which we covered earlier in this lecture. This is to make sure that the important events of the cycle only take place when the cell is completely prepared. And this is where the checkpoints come in, which again, we covered earlier. So as we covered, the cell can either hold the cell momentarily in G1 or in a longer lasting non-proliferative state, G0, or allow it to get ready to enter the S phase. We covered what the G0 phase is in the previous lecture. Now, here's the thing. Animal cells won't proliferate unless they are stimulated to do so by extracellular signals produced by other cells. These signals are known as mitogens. If these signals are not present, the cell cycle will stop at G1. If mitogens are not present for an extended period of time, the cell will withdraw from the cell cycle and enter a non-proliferating state, where it can stay for days, weeks, months, or even the entire lifespan of the organism. So then, if that's the case, how do we get the cell cycle to proceed? Well, this is where the cyclins come in. We need to produce cyclins. So what mitogens do is function by activating cell signaling pathways, which we won't go through in this lecture, that increase the production of G1 and G1S cyclins, as well as other proteins essential for DNA synthesis and chromosomal duplication. And one way in which mitogens can promote cell proliferation is by blocking the RB protein, or retinoblastoma protein. This is going to be quite overwhelming, so let's slow down for a second. All vertebrate cells contain large amounts of RB in their nuclei, where it binds to specific transcription regulators and blocks them from activating the genes necessary for cell growth and proliferation. In particular, dephosphorylated RB protein keeps particular transcription regulators inactive in the, abs in the absence of mitogens. And so when mitogens bind to cell surface receptors, this right here, it will trigger intracellular signaling pathways, which we're not going to go through in this lecture, which then produce and activate the G1CDK and G1SCDK complexes. And what these complexes will do is phosphorylate the RB protein, rendering it inactive. It's going to add phosphate groups to this RB protein. This then allows the transcription regulators, this right here, to be released and trigger the transcription of the genes needed for S phase entrance. Okay, let's go through this one more time. Mitogens cause G1CDKs and G1SCDKs to become active. Okay, there's going to be intracellular signaling pathway occurring here. These complexes phosphorylate the RB protein, which changes its shape and frees the transcription regulator that were attached to it, allowing them to activate the genes needed for S phase entry. Okay, let's go through one more thing before we move on to the S phase. Earlier, we mentioned that if there's some damage to the DNA, the cell cycle will not continue, okay? If there is DNA damage in G1, so here we have some damaged DNA that could have been caused by x-rays, the concentration and activity of a protein called P53 will increase. P53 is a transcription activator that activates the gene encoding a CDK inhibitor protein called P21. So when DNA is damaged, specific protein kinases will phosphorylate and activate the P53 protein. Okay, so it's going to add pro I mean phosphate groups to it. If there's no DNA damage, P53 is broken down. And then the activated P53 protein will stimulate the transcription of the gene that encodes P21, which is a CDK inhibitor. And what P21 does is it will bind to the G1SCDK and SCDK to stop them from driving the cell into S phase. Because before the cell can enter the S phase, the cell needs time to repair the damaged DNA before it can replicate it, 
recall that the S phase is the synthesis phase. So we need to make sure that the DNA is all good to go before the cell can start replicating it. Now, when DNA damage is too severe to be repaired, P53 might cause the cell to undergo apoptosis, programmed cell death, which causes it to die. And if P53 is missing or ineffective, the unchecked replication of damaged DNA can lead to a high rate of mutation and the production of cells that tend to become cancerous. Okay, so that's the G1 phase and some of the regulatory processes. Let's move on to the S phase. The SCDK complex activates the S phase. SCDK is formed and activated at the end of G1. And during the S phase, SCDK stimulates the DNA helicase. Recall that DNA helicase unzips the double helix at the replication forks. It separates the two strands for DNA synthesis to occur, using these strands as the template strands. And if there are any errors that occur during DNA replication, the cell can delay entry into the M phase. Recall that for MCDK to be active, inhibitory phosphates must be removed by a protein phosphatase called CDC25. But if there's some sort of damage or error, the cell will prevent the removal of the inhibitory phosphates from MCDK. So the MCDK remains inactive and the M phase is delayed until DNA replication is complete and any DNA damage is repaired. Beautiful process. And once a cell has replicated its DNA successfully, it can continue through G2 and enter the M phase. And this leads us to the M phase, which is driven by MCDK complexes. Another term is MPF or maturation promoting factor. So the MCDK helps prepare the chromosomes for segregation and triggers the production of the mitotic spindle. And that's the apparatus that separates the sister chromatids. The MCDK complexes are not turned on until the inhibitory phosphates are removed by the phosphatase CDC25. Now the same MCDK complexes that drive entry into mitosis also help set the stage for its exit. When MCDK is active, it's also going to activate the anaphase promoting complex. This is a protein complex that causes M cyclones to be destroyed starting in anaphase. What happens when M cyclones are destroyed? It's going to force the cell out of mitosis so the new daughter cells can enter G1. It's broken down in anaphase, so then the sister chromatids can say goodbye to each other and be pulled to the opposing poles of the cell because the APC also breaks down the proteins that keep them together. Okay, so it activates and destroys itself. But let's go through how APC does this. It's a beautiful process. APC is an enzyme that attaches a small protein called ubiquitin. UB. When you're tagged with ubiquitin, it will be sent to the proteasome and be degraded. Okay, so the ubiquitination and breakdown of the cyclin returns its CDK to an inactive state. The APC also plays a role in the separation of sister chromatids. The protein glue that keeps sister chromatids together, cohesin, is destroyed if the APC receives the proper signals during metaphase. So the APC First, it's going to add a UB tag to a protein called securin. A protein term separase is generally bound by securin, which then makes it inactive. Securin is then recycled because it's tagged with UB. And once it is activated, separase can do its job by breaking down the cohesin that keeps the sister chromatids together. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating.